Good morning, we'll try it. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to Garfield Church. Uh, it's a pleasure to see all of you here in person on this beautiful sunny day. It feels like spring. And I welcome everyone who's joining us in worship online. I'd like to ask you please stand as you're able and join me in the call to worship and then follow by singing along with us hymn number 92. Lord, you come to us in unexpected ways. Awaken our curiosity that we might turn aside and realize that we are standing on holy ground. Reveal the glory of your kingdom, where love is genuine, where evil is forsaken, where mutual affection abides, and hospitality is shown to strangers, and where all are made one. Prayers for Joe as he recovers from his 
we bow down before you in our hearts and come to you because where else can we go? You're the creator of, of us all. You're the healer, you're the one who brings comfort, and Lord, there's no way we can even begin to understand the suffering that's going on in the wake of the earthquakes in Syria and Turkey. And we pray for all those offering aid, and we pray that more lives may, might be found, might be saved. But God, this is your world. And as the old <coughs> song says, you've got the whole world in your hand. Um, even when we can't see or feel you, you're there. So help us to experience your presence today as we worship, as we prepare to hear scripture read and your word preached. And help us to respond and to live out what you call us to, to help to connect diverse people who share a common brokenness with you, Lord. And to widen the circle, to show love to, to all. And to appreciate the beautiful diversity of, of all your people and all that you do. So God, we find our voices together as we pray the way that you modeled for us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Before we uh, go to our offering time, I just want to share a little bit um, about today's message. We're continuing our three-part series, Love, Sex, and Marriage. And today is the sex part. Yeah. Woo-hoo! And it's entitled The Significance of Sexual Intimacy. And so we have sent out an email and have announced that this is the, uh, the theme today so that we realize that it may be uncomfortable for some, especially in church. Although, really, the way the world talks about and thinks about sex, we really probably should be talking more about it here in church. Um, but Pastor Chip is prepared to address this in a sensitive way. He's put a lot of thought into it. We've talked over the information he's going to share. I think it's really going to be helpful. But that said, if, if you have young children in here or you're just not comfortable, we invite you to go out to the lobby when it's time for the sermon. And we are offering, if you end up going out into our main lobby, a free drink from the cafe. We've got little cupcakes for the kids. Um, if there are any here that want to, you can text the message later if you want, uh, either Heritage Online or watch the message from Mosaic. But um, the Bible really has a lot to say about what God intended for sexual intimacy. And it's meant to be a beautiful thing. And I think we're all going to, after this message, feel that it's been really helpful. So just that's the caveat. So if you need to leave, leave. Don't leave me insulted. Don't leave me mad. Uh, and we understand if you feel a little bit uncomfortable. And so, at, as we come to our offering, I will say, if you're new here, we'd like you to go to newatgmc.org. We have a fun survey and a way to stay in touch beyond our worship time today. Um, and if you are new, we don't expect you to give. We simply want you to come and receive. But if you are a regular tender, a member of Garfield, we appreciate all that you give. Um, we give because it's a response to God, not because the church is trying to chisel the money out of us, but because God has been so generous to us in giving us his son. It's easy to give. There's information in the bulletin. And there's also a little paragraph in there about, you know, many of you have been asking, how can I help? How can we provide relief um, at a uh, terrifying situation uh, in the wake of the earthquakes? And um, we have a special uh, fund. As part of the United Methodist Church, everything we give goes, a portion of what we give goes into mission all around the world. So you're by giving, you're automatically helping with disaster relief like this. But if you'd like to give a second mile gift, there's instructions in your bulletin about how you can do that easily. You can text to our website. If you're writing a check, you can just write disaster in the memo line, and it'll go there. But we are grateful for all that you give and all that you do and all the ways in which you give the mission. Let's worship God by the gift of our gifts for time.
we offer these gifts, these tithes, these offerings to you. You're the source of all things, all good things. And you have been so generous to us. So bless these, these gifts. Use them for your work and your world. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's Bible reading is from the first book of Thessalonians. It's printed on the back of your bulletin if you'd like to follow along. Sisters, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that, as you learn from us how you ought to live and to please God, as in fact you are doing, you should do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification that you abstain from fornication, that each one of you knows how to control your own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passion, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one wrongs or exploits a brother or sister in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, just as we have already told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. You notice I'm doing this in year 19, right? Uh, I actually did do something on this topic a few years ago, but didn't touch it my first 10 years. Somebody out there say coward. It's true. It's true. I am. Um, I laughed because I was at a seminary, and this is way back, uh, you know, right in 1990, and they, there was somebody who said, you know, 
Don't preach about sex or money in your churches because it'll make people uncomfortable. And then I went to a family counseling class and there was a, a, a series about what causes divorce. And the top two things that cause divorce, I mean, not even a close third, <laughs> sex and money. So they're basically telling preachers, don't even speak about what's tearing apart families in this country. Don't, don't do that, you know. Um, and so it feels a little awkward, but I was with Linda Hynes, and she was making fun of me, and then she was out in the hall hallway, and she said, oh, I got the email and all this. She's out in the hallway, and she came up to me, and she said, look, I have to leave after the anthem, but, you know, it's not about what you're preaching. And I said, that's okay. Pastor Terry's got to get up and share. If you're uncomfortable, just leave. And she went. <laughs> So I just said that so Lynn is covered. We got your cover. We know where you're at. I, um, I got three little funny things that happened on the way to this sermon. Uh, I, you know, I've been sharing, we've been sharing our series on our social media and other things. Scott has, Terry has, I have, the church has. And uh, so I got, a, I got an email from one of you uh, in this service. And I got uh, an email from a pastor I know who saw I was doing about. And then I had a comment from my wife. You notice she's not sitting here this morning. Uh, <laughs> But uh, the first one, somebody from this, this service emailed me and said that um, you'd gone down to a Cavs game with your son, and he, he and his wife, uh, his wife is pregnant, his daughter-in-law, with their third child. And uh, they, I think they have a 10-year-old daughter, uh, about a 6 or 7-year-old son, and now they're awaiting the third one. And so they're going down to the Cavs game, and it was a member here, uh, his adult son, and their 6 or 7-year-old grandson. And in the car on the way down, the grandson said, Daddy, how do babies get in mommy's tummies? <laughs> and you who emailed me were laughing, saying, my son handled this. And he started hemming and hawing and trying to come up with, with uh, comments and illustrations. And finally, he said, his grandson said, Dad, you don't have to make stuff up. <laughs> if you don't know how they get there either, it's fine. <laughs> I love that. And a pastor friend said to me, he was, he's uh, younger than me, but he follows me, and, and he said that uh, you know, he has two daughters. Uh, one is eight or nine, and the other is uh, four. And he said his eight or nine-year-old had come home from school, and I guess they started to talk about sex for the first time. And he said his nine, eight or nine-year-old walked up to him and said, Dad, I know how it happens. And he said, why? He said, I know how babies are treated. And he said, great, honey, you want to sit down and talk about it? She said, no, I just want to make sure you and mom never did that. <laughs> and he said, well, how do you think you got here? He said, well, I hope you didn't do it more than twice. <laughs> Love that. And today, when I, early this morning, I was up drinking coffee, and Terry you know, knows what I'm preaching about. And she said, um, honey, you know how sometimes I tell you you talk a little too much sometimes about our marriage and everything? I said, yes, honey. She said, today would be a really good day to remember that. So I, those are my three things. And, and it is a little awkward, right? It's a little awkward for us to talk about sexual intimacy, maybe more so in the church. And yet, it's talked about everywhere else, right? You don't watch the Super Bowl today? Watch the ads, right? Then watch some TV shows. And even when our children are little, I know with mine, you can totally protect them from that, and, and they're getting innuendos and, and other things, commercials, billboards, magazines, internet ads, right? Marketing 101 says what? Sex sells. So, our, you know, our young people and others, our culture are going to be exposed to this, and when the church is afraid to talk about it, I think we're losing a very important witness. The, the Bible speaks a lot about sex and sexual intimacy. It's a beautiful ideal in the Bible of what sexual intimacy can and should be. And the church has an important voice. My wife just walked in in the back. I'm glad you were late. Um, the church has an important voice about beauty and sacredness of sex. And we have done a disservice, I think, not helping our culture know the deeper meanings of this gift from God. Okay? So when we're talking about marriage and relationships, like we're on this three-part series leading up to Valentine's Day and beyond, it's important to talk about this because it is an important part of relationships. We are sexual creatures, right? That's Sigmund Freud. And this is something that can and does cause great frustration in relationships. The Bible is not afraid or ashamed to talk about sex and sexual intimacy. We find that in our reading today. Okay, Paul is writing to the church of Thessalonica, 
Um, this is a very, very young church. In fact, you may not know this, but First and Second Thessalonians are the old scholars in this one are consensus. They debate about a lot of things. They don't debate on this one. First and Second Thessalonians are the oldest pieces of writing in the New Testament. By far and away the oldest ones. So this is pretty contemporary uh, to the time where, um, you know, uh, when Paul was, not long after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, maybe decades. And, and Paul is writing to this very, very young church, and he's giving them practical instruction. He's saying, I know you're trying to live in light of the gospel. I know you're trying to live out, um, you know, put this application in your life, not just look at the resurrection, wait for Jesus to come back. And if you heard what Scott said, I said, I know you're doing this, but I want you to do it more and more. I love that. I want you to do it more and more. In fact, then always be diligent to make sure that you're, you know, uh, bearing down the gospel in all parts of your life. And he uses three very practical illustrations. He says, how is the gospel applying to sex, money, and death? Right? Three things we're probably all going to wander across at some point in our lives. So he takes these two things, and he, and he talks about them, and he, he talks about illustrating, um, you know, how, how we strive to have the gospel in all areas of our lives. That Christians are called to live radically different in basic areas, right? And... and uh, the Christian attitude, so let me just touch on those three, but I'm going to hone down on, on the issue of sexual intimacy. But when it comes to death, if you read Thessalonians, um, you know, Paul talks about that we go into death with confidence in Christ. And it's well reported that the Greco-Roman world that viewed the Christians, how they handled death, they, they were astonished by it. You know, one, one Christian bishop in the first century said, our people die well. Because they would be dying in the Colosseum, right? Fed to the lions, executed by gladiators. And they would be singing hymns. And, and nobody had ever seen that before. And Paul is supporting that. And when it came to sex and money, there's one of the oldest pieces of Christian writing. Is it called a letter to a, a Diognetius? And it was um, a, a writing from the early Christians, an instruction. It was preserved, they believe, from the 2nd century. That's the 100s, if, you, if you're not thinking. It's a very early writing. And in it, the author, they thought was just a martyr, but they know it probably isn't now. They're not sure who it was. But look at this statement. The statement says in this letter, We share our table with all, but not our bed with all. Now that was absolutely diametrically opposed. To the Greco-Roman culture. Because the Greco-Roman culture shared their bed with all, but not their table with all. See, in that culture, it was, it was expected, especially in men, it was always a male-dominated society, but men had sex with everybody. I mean, they had sex with women, they had sex with old men, they had practice in the gymnasiums, they would do horrible stuff in the, in the pagan temples, they would have, uh, I was required to have like a mistress, a concubine, and a, a female servant, that this was their job. I mean, they're having sex all over the place. And Christians come and say, no, there's a, there's a context for sex. And it's in marriage. And in the Greco-Roman culture, they didn't share their table with anybody. They hoarded their money. Right? The, the, the disparity of wealth started in the Roman Empire. They didn't share. But the, but the Christians were faithful in sexual intimacy and promiscuous with their money. They, they just spent it anywhere as anyone had need. Totally, totally <coughs> an absolute different, radically different approach. Now, I want to say to you that the pagan approach in that context of sharing your sex with everybody and sharing your money with nobody destroyed that society. And I want to ask you today, in our own America and Western culture, which one are we more like? Sharing our, our table with all and sharing our bed with none or, or not our bed with all or sharing our bed with all and hoarding and spending our money and our wealth only on ourselves. I won't give you the answer to what social scientists are saying about that. And if it destroyed that early society, it could destroy ours. So what does the Bible say about the significance of sexual intimacy, okay? I want to give you three big ideas. The first one is this. There is a sacredness to sexual intimacy. 
And the ultimate picture of this is in creation, in the creation stories. What do you take them? Literally or historically? What do you take them? Figuratively? In a poem? We know it's a true story. You can't explain the human race without the stories of creation, right? And at the climax of the story, no pun intended, I know, I know that's going to happen through this whole message. Um, but at that pinnacle of, of the foundational story, it's a picture of what? It's a picture of sexual intimacy. As the two created ones, right? Do you read it? Genesis 2, 24 and 25. It's the last two verses of the creation story. And it's a picture of sexual intimacy. The two cling to are joined with one another. The two become one flesh. The Hebrew can be, be interpreted united as one. And they were both naked and not ashamed. In fact, the Hebrew there can be translated, they felt no shame. And, and, and the, the God of the universe, the creator of the universe, is not ashamed to place this as the pinnacle of the human story. Because there's not something dirty or tawdry or something to sniff or at when we talk about sexual intimacy. It's a gift from God. Now, unfortunately, the church has missed this point through the centuries. And they've created a sense that there is something dirty and we shouldn't talk about. There's been times in church history where churches went so far as to say, you shouldn't even have sexual intimacy unless you're having a child. Which is so far from the biblical witness. It, it's impossible. Um, and so we, we look at that, the sacredness in creation, and we also do look that, yes, you know, sexual intimacy is part of procreation. Now, in case you missed what I said, sexual intimacy is not simply for bearing children, but it is the key component, something in our bodies God created, that through sexual intimacy, right, uh, human beings are formed. And at that point, God invites us in, if you think about it, to be co-creators with God. And all this points to the fact that it's holy and sacred and something very, very meaningful and beautiful is holy. So the sacredness of sexual intimacy and the other piece is that sexual intimacy binds together. When, when they came together, Adam and Eve came together, they clung to one another. They became one flesh. They were capturing in physical form what was also supposed to be happening psychologically and emotionally and spiritually. When we give out rings at weddings, right, we put them on our thing and we say these rings are a physical outward and symbol of an inward and spiritual grace. And it's the same with sexual intimacy. The gift uh, that God has given us, what's happening physically, is a sign of what should be happening emotionally and spiritually. It's a larger picture of God's intention for us to nurture oneness and hold us together in marriage or in a covenant relationship. I yearn for you, you yearn for me, and this leads us to want to hold on to one another. And science proves what the Bible is saying here, actually, because uh, during sexual intimacy, two um, chemicals are released in the brain. And i got a physician up here up front, so I know he will love correcting me if I'm wrong. But I read this on the internet, so it has to be true. Um, <laughs> the two chemicals that are released, one is called oxytocin, and the other vasopressin. And oxytocin, if you know, is a cuddle hormone. It's also released in women when they breastfeed. Because it's creating a, a link and a bond between the child and the mother. And in sexual intimacy, the same thing is happening. The same hormone is binding together, imprinting on one another. Um, in fact, one medical journal says as ox oxytocin is released, it acts as emotional superglue between the two who are becoming one. Vasopressin also, it says, has a binding linking hormone and also produces a sense of protectiveness, okay? Here's what the journal said. If oxytocin is released, it acts as emotional superglue <coughs> between partners. One way of thinking about this bond is to imagine these hormones are like, are like duct taping a couple's arms together. And after a breakup or after switching partners, that same duct tape is ripped off along with particles of skin and hair, reducing its stickiness and the ability to bond to a new partner. When I teach on this to youth, I usually get a piece of carpet and I take duct tape and I say, well, bond it here and I rip it off. And I say, no, we're going to bond it over here and I rip it off. No, we're going to bond it over here and rip it off. And then I hold that duct tape and it's lost all of its stickiness. Right? 
And similarly, there's a research that suggests when stress hormones are released, as can happen after a breakup, then the ability of oxytocin to create bonding of the partners is reduced as the oxytocin levels actually drop. Actually drop. Research also shows that oxytocin levels will increase to normal if sexual activity is stopped and time is given for emotional and physical healing after a breakup. Now imagine that the duct tape was never removed, the adhesion, and thus the bondings of partners would remain strong. In monogamous and faithful relationships, for example, oxytocin and vasopressin biologically increase the bond. See, science is only, is only you know, underwriting what the Bible already told us, that sexual intimacy helps bind together. And the last thing is sexual intimacy reveals and makes known. Right? If, did you read uh, uh, Genesis 4.1? It's throughout the Bible. Adam knew Eve, and they bore a son. That word in the Hebrew is yada, for no. You remember Seinfeld? Yada, yada, yada. You remember you use that? What's that mean? I know, I know, I know. Right? But yada's deeper than that. It just doesn't mean I know, I know. It means to reveal. It means uh, to be wholly known. It means to understand. Right? To see another person. Being naked before another is to reveal yourself whole or holy to another. And again, it's just an image of revealing our most intimate parts of ourselves. Uh, maybe it might be physically, but it's representing again what's happening psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually. Right? Terry and I, uh, I, I knew I was going to marry Terry two, the first two weeks I met her. She wasn't so sure, so I stopped her for a year. Um, <laughs> But she remembers the times, we had not been physically intimate or anything, but she remembered the time where I bore my soul and I talked to her about my hurts and my relationship with my dad. And she said it was at those moments that I did that, that she felt fully in love. It's not just seeing each other physically, but it's the act of seeing and having a deeper awareness for knowing one another. So here's the review, biblically. Sexual intimacy is sacred and awesome in its power. A moment where we can co-create with our Creator. Two, it has this idea of being bound together deeper and more profoundly than we could possibly imagine. And three, it's the idea of revealing ourselves to others and seeing them in a way that we are fully known. I wonder if that was ever described to you, growing up in that context of what sexual intimacy is. I sure never heard it when I was in my formative years. And the challenge is that today, our society doesn't understand any of these meanings I just shared with you. None of them. Probably partly because the church is just too doggone afraid and ashamed to talk about it. Even when I'm talking about it here at this wonderful place where our core value is safety. We had to give four disclaimers. One this morning, one by email, two at other announcements, right? But in, in, in it's a reason that the absence of hearing this teaching, sex has been so trivialized, so ch cheapened, and thought of so casually, so we talk about hooking up and having friends with benefits, right? And here's how it goes out there in the world, right? So I just met you, and we had a great first date. Now let's go be intimate with each other. And if we take what God intended with this power, watch what happens. First, first date, right? I'm going to reveal my most intimate being. I'm going to be bound to you and know you all the way down. <coughs> I've known you for six hours. And now I'm going to be one with you? Right? For this power. And because we cheapen and trivialize it, the power that it was created for is robbed of it. Just like the duct tape, no longer able to be, to do its function. Right? And so Paul writes this, but this is the will of God for you, your sanctification. That you abstain from fornication. That word there is pornea. It's where we get our word pornography. It was Paul was saying sex has a context, it's within marriage. So anything, pornea, is uh, before marriage or outside of marriage, right? That, it, that, that the, the fullness of sex can only work in a, in a lifetime covenant relationship, right? Now, I know I'm going to hear this probably from you. Um, some of you are going to say, this is water over the bridge. That's all right. Don't burn down the school just because you graduate. Um, <coughs> but, uh, you know, the next service, I know I'll hear it talking about, oh, come on, Chip. You know, that's antiquated. That's unrealistic. Uh, you know, wait until you get married. Uh, listen, I know the times. Right? Like the men of Issachar in the Bible. They understood the times. I'm not trying to be judgmental with anybody. Okay? And God is a God of grace. Paul knew this, that we all, Romans 3.23, we all fall short 
of God's glorious standard. But shouldn't we still know what the glorious standard is? Even though we all maybe fall short of it, and maybe we've fallen short of it before. The biblical idea, here's what it was, that two people would make a covenant with each other, so whether in sickness or in health, whether poor or rich, whether right now when you're at your physical peak and beautiful, or when you grow older and wrinkles appear and your hair starts to fall out and you put on a few pounds, I'm going to love you. I'm going to care for you. In light of those vows, those two people reveal themselves to one another, bind themselves together. And, they, and this physical gift represents what's happening emotionally, spiritually, and this one rich and deepen them together in love. And before we totally discard this idea, and I, you know, I, I'm tempted to, we all are, there was a study done of 2,000 married couples uh, who uh, uh, was done, it was published, it was a psychological study, it was published in the Journal of Family Psychology, and it revealed that most couples had not waited to be intimate, very few had waited until, you know, after they had, you know, uh, uh, said their, their uh, marriage vows. Um, and, but for those that had, okay, for those that had, uh, they rated the stability of their marriage 22% higher than those who had. And they reported a 20% increased level of relational satisfaction, 12% higher in communication, and watch this, they reported the 15% higher rating of the quality of their sex life. Isn't that interesting? So there's something to be said for those who fumbled along and figured it out as they went. Right? Um, but what I'm trying to say in all of this is to say from a biblical and spiritual perspective, let's take sex seriously and speak graciously against, graciously against its trivialization. Recognize that it's profound. It was, it was meant to have a profound purpose in our lives. You see, I'm more tied to my notes than usually, but I don't want to screw this up. And how about we'd be willing to talk about this other when there's a time. So I'm not going to bore you with this. There's going to be about 14 minutes down the hall, so I'm sparing you of that. Because there was a survey done. Um, I, I know the pastor. It's a large church, a mainline church, a very centrist church. It's not a flaming liberal church. It's not an ultra-conservative evangelical church. It's, it's folk just like you and I. And they, they surveyed 5,177 people. 3,400 of them are, were married. And uh, I'm going to show the results of those surveys at the next service. So if you want to look at that, just tune in online. Or if you want to come back in for that part of the sermon, come on down. Um, I just i am not able to show it in here, unfortunately. But, but what, what they're showing is they're charting at the beginning levels of satisfaction and dissatisfaction between married couples, male, female, uh, same-sex couples, etc. What is your... What is your satisfaction uh, with your sexual intimacy in your life? And you can respond very satisfied, satisfied, neutral, which is kind of a negative response, unsatisfied, very satisfied, right? And you look at people in their 20s, this kind of surprised me. You know, when you're in your 20s, you're assuming every married person is having sex 365 days a year, right? And so especially men. You know, I used to golf with guys and all of us were pity partying because we're sure everybody else is better and all. The truth is, 25% um, of, of, you know, couples in their 20s, when they're at their physical sexual peak, are dissatisfied, right, in their relationship. But guess what happens? When that goes to the 30s, 40s, and 50s, in the 30s, there's a huge jump, primarily in men, a major frustration across that. 55% of men across those three 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, say that their sexual intimacy in their life is not going very well. Right? What happens? It, and, and this thing, it's interesting. It peaks in the 40s, and then begins to come down a little bit in the 50s, comes down dramatically in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, and finally in the 80s, people say, married couples in their 80s say, they rate their sexual life at the highest it's ever been. Is that a little surprising? I'll tell you about that in a minute. So what happened in the 30s? that caused the shoot in dissatisfaction? Kids. Children, right? Children. And careers, right? And, uh, and people are tired, they're worn down, they don't have anything left to give. I read the comments in these surveys because they had little comments, and I love the 40-year-old husband who said, frankly, at this time, we're just too pooped to whoop. <laughs> 
But if you, if you look at that chart, it keeps getting better and better. And, and when sexual frustration is at its lowest level, is in the 80s, which corresponds to the increase in satisfaction. And it, um, and it, it's saying it, the people in the 80s are showing us that sexual intimacy is a lot more than what we thought it was. It's touching, it's kind words, it's having a good laugh together. Um, and so that's what I want to say to people today when I'm down the hall and in here, some of you in here, I won't mention by name. If you're in 30s and your 40s and you're frustrated right now, it's going to get better. Just hang in there. You know, hold on. It shows us, you know, up to the 40s and it begins to go down and it becomes the greatest it's ever been. I, I read something about, um, uh, on this, I was studying, well, let me skip that. I'll do that down the hall because this will just make you mad. But the truth is, uh, David, Sh David Shanks, well, it won't make you mad. Um, you guys have been really polite to me. Um, David Shank wrote a, wrote a book called Intimacy and Desire. He's a physical therapist. I was talking to some therapists in our congregation. They said that's the gold standard. And I went and read it, and it said in every relationship, no matter what it is, across the board, there's a high desire partner and a low desire partner when it comes to it. It's always, a, no, it's never equal, right? And, and so when there's a frustration, it's kind of the low desire partners holding all the cards, right? And so he, he suggests some things um, as I was reading this and reading through the survey. Have you ever heard things like the high, the low desire person will say things like this. All they ever want to do is be in on it. Why can't you just hold me, cuddle me? Why do you have to always want to be like this? And the high desire partner says things like this. What, don't you care about me? Is there something you're not interested in? Don't you love me? Am I not desirable? And thus this frustration goes on and on, and it's good to know that. Here's the things I want to tell people today. First, you're normal. <laughs> if, you, if you've ever gone through this, or if you've gone through this, you're normal. It's not terminal. This is the way it is. And secondly, he says, we need to learn the art of compromise. We need to learn to dance together. And so whoever's the high desire and the low desire begin to communicate. And, and it's always a give and take because we understand it's an important part of our, of our relationship. And in marriage, we, we say, I want to bless you and encourage you and strengthen you and build you up. And then fourthly, we need to realize, and that, I love this one, it's not always going to be a wow. It's not always a 10. Sometimes it's a 1, and that's okay. One person said, and I'm so afraid to share this, but he said, think about the meals you eat. Is every meal going to be a five-course gourmet meal? <laughs> what does it take to have a five-course gourmet meal at home? Think of the menu. You have to go to the store, think of the menu, go to the store, buy the special ingredients, then take a couple hours to put it all together. Are you following the metaphor? Right? Um, but sometimes, every once in a while, you might have a five-course meal, but uh, you're also going to eat a lot of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches along the way. Why do I feel like you guys are just leaving me hanging here right now? <laughs> I don't know. I, because it's okay. You can live on peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And once in a while you have a gourmet meal. Um, I wish somebody would have told me that 40 years ago. That every time, you know, we get together, it doesn't have to be a gourmet meal. It's okay to have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Peanut butter and jelly sandwich is quick. It's fast. I wish I didn't say that. It's nutritious. <laughs> it's nutritious. But that's how it's worked. So it's okay to have one. Lord have mercy. I'm sorry, honey. I'm doing the best I can. She's just shaking her head. All right. But this is something we've worked at together. Okay, I'm going to show the slides for each of the generations. Um, but here's something we learned in the surveys, which is really interesting to me. The frequency of couples, let's say, were experiencing sexual intimacy at least twice a week. Okay. They, do you know, I'm using that as a baseline from ages 19 to 59. Here's what we found out in those series from church folk. 71% of those folk go on a date at least once a month. 71%. Very high percentage versus those who didn't date once a month. Second thing, 80% of them attend worship weekly. So I don't know what that means. I have chicken and egg. But there's some correlation between spiritual intimacy and physical intimacy is the way God created it. Thirdly, 57% of those spend more than 30 minutes a day in conversation. That's 210 minutes a week. Do you know that was double or triple the rate of people less intimate in their physical life, right? So, so again, there's correlation between conversation and friendship and this physical activity. And the last thing, couples who said they prayed together daily were twice as likely to have more sexual intimacy 
that I want out. It, it's just, I don't know what to do with all that. I'm not a psychologist. We have some here who are trained in that, but I, I am a theologian. <coughs> and there's something saying that God gave us this gift. And it's a gift that is to imitate also the way God seeks to be in relationship with us. What, what did Jesus say? I am the bridegroom, adorned for a bride. If you read the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, every people, every time people wandered from God, you know what God accused them of? Adultery. You fall in love, you're intimate with other things instead of me. So we need to talk about these things, okay? Uh, Helen Gurley Brown, I read, saw, I, I read an interview with her years ago. She was 73 years old at the time. Anybody know who he uh, Helen Gurley Brown is? Yeah, Cosmo Palm. You guys, boy, a lot of hands up here. I can't wait to ask him at the next service. I'll say, Cosmo, what? <laughs> um, but, you know, editor of Cosmo. And she said the interview is this. She said, I've always said the, the three best things in life, one is sex. And the interviewer said, what? And she said, who knows? <laughs> That's what she said, 73. And the, and the interviewer said, what about love? I've read this, and here's what she said. Love is impossible to define and even more possible to have. It's too difficult. That's the world's understanding about sex and sexual intimacy, about divorce from love. Uh, and if you read Cosmopolitan, I don't mean if you read it, if you just look at Cosmopolitan and any of the magazines have basically been inspired, there you have it, right? And nobody looks like that, by the way. I'll be honest with you, you don't. I, you know, stumble up on their house when they haven't been with their personal trainer or their personal chef and there's no makeup and there's no hair artist. The people don't even look like that. Nobody does. But we pretend because we're, we're putting a mask on our own insecurity. But I want you to know there is true love in this Valentine's Day. Greater has love has no one than this, Jesus says. I'm the bride gained, adorned for the bride. And we will see, and when we see the significance of, of, of of uh, sexual intimacy as a gift is to fuel our love for one another in lifelong intimate and covenant relationships and even taking it to the highest spiritual level to nourish our, our relationship with God. Let me close with this. Um, I love the comment from one woman in these surveys, one just like us. Um, I think they were, were just about to turn 70, but her and her spouse were unable to have physical sexual intimacy due to physical complications. Um, she wrote this, though health issues make this impossible for us now, there are still many ways for us to physically express our love. Many, many hugs and kisses, loving looks to each other, and we flirt with each other all the time. We fell deeply in love without physical sex prior to marriage, and we know that while it's a joyous part of a marriage, it's not the only measure of deep love. We are still diving deeper every day, and we've yet to reach the bottom of the sea. I love that. So I think what God intends for us um, in this great gift is it's meant to help us bless one another. It's not the only thing, and it's not what we've been thought to think. It's tender touch, it's romantic conversations, it's laughing together, it's building friendship, and these things will help us to build a love that will last a lifetime. And that's what I want to talk about next week. Okay, everybody ready? Exhale. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for helping us understand all of the intricacies of life and relationship. Lord, uh, shame on us when we try to trivialize or make dirty or snicker about things in your word that are gifts for our lives. Help us, um, Lord, uh, to extend our table to all, but not our bed to all. Help us to be the reverse society. Help us understand that how we live and, and grow more and more is a witness against the ways that uh, things have been trivialized. And Lord, help us to hear you so that we can build a love that lasts a lifetime with you, first and foremost, with those who are closest to us, and frankly, with all others as we seek to love the way you have loved us. In Jesus' name, amen.
as something beautiful and precious that binds us together in love. In Jesus' name.